podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Welcome to another episode of the Barbless Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Chad Alderson. How you guys doing? Um, hey, before we get started with this episode, which is pretty killer because we got somebody from NOAA on, uh, I want to make an announcement. We've got a new website, and it's for leader formulas. So you can build and share leader formulas with this website. So if you have any uh, you know, good dry fi le- leader setups, or if you want to learn about some check nymphing setups, you can go to this site, get the formula, get a build list, and build that thing at home or wherever you so choose. Uh, to sign up for it, Go to podcast.barbless.co forward slash beta. And what we're going to be doing is sending out beta invites this week, um, probably around Wednesday or so. And you'll get the invite and go to the site and create an account and get ripping. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Barbless Five Fishing Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Alderson. With me is Nick Hanna, right off the fresh, river. Fresh off the river. He's even got his rubber boots on. <laughs> what, what are you wearing today, it was Nick, 70, on your feet? It was 77 degrees in Reading today. Are those Isn't that uh, amazing? It's middle December. 77 is pretty crazy, and we're going to go fish with Dirty Ernie tomorrow. I know. I'm kind of excited. I'm glad you said that, though, because I was going to dress warm, and now I'm not. It's it's cold in the morning, but yeah, it got it got really warm. Do you, do you think I can get my pupa white feet or legs <laughs> tan tomorrow or no? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I almost took my shirt off. The fishing was was slow, so we'll see how, how tomorrow is. All right. Well, Hopefully. we are with Ernie. Oh, supposed right. to be the biggest, fishiest dude on that river, so right. <laughs> we'll see. Well... We did digress a little bit. Now we're back on track. We've got a really cool guest today, Monica Gutierrez. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Nick's pretty good too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I just, <laughs> I know he's sitting right next to me. So I just looked yeah, over and I'm like, okay, I give him a uh, nod. I'm, I know he's there. I'm Captain Obvious good. a lot. For the, <laughs> those folks that listen, they know this. Well, Monica is a fisheries biologist at uh, NOAA, the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, or NMFS. NIMFS. NIMFS in Sacramento. And she's going to explain the relationship between NOAA and NIMFS in a second. Um, it's so cool. I love it. You don't know how yeah. many times I pull up the website and I'm looking for, like, what am I, where am I going to go fishing? Yeah. What's, what's coming in? What's the weather going to do? Oh, is awesome. it going to blow this river yeah. up? I mean, <laughs> and there's a lot of our listeners that use the website and NOAA consistently yeah, and Sorry. i want to get i want to get one more no the the acronym of NOAA out of the way and then and then we'll we'll proceed um so that it is the national oceanic and atmospheric administration so well done say that three times oh. fast <laughs> so monica you know works works for an arm of NOAA called nmfs which i just talked about her nymphs um she is really like focused on the uh, san joaquin river basin so the question we always ask before we get started in the, in the gory details is, uh, have you been fishing lately? Um, explain lately. <laughs> it's like, well, that's actually been a couple of... Have you bought a fishing of... license this year yet? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, just... So the last time I went fishing was actually at the tail end of the fall run Chinook salmon season. So that was probably around um, the beginning of October. And um, I know it's a little bit different for each watershed, but... Uh, I went out over in the Feather River, and it was my first time going out with a guide uh, because I've gone out salmon fishing before, but it was um, on the Sac River from the bank. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty tough for me because imagine me, my size, I'm really (laughs) petite, trying to cast this really big rod well into the river and trying to even catch a fish, let alone a salmon was very difficult so yeah, just for the listeners monica's maybe five five 
five four no, three five three five two <laughs> I'm pretty But you're not too. in a high chair. You're not in a high chair. No, so. I'm not in a high chair. Yeah. No. <laughs> How was the, did you guys go to the outlet on the feathered? Yeah, we, yeah, we were, were, yeah, we were, were on that, the Thermalito after bay. So yeah. the whole boat, Playing bumper the boat boats. rodeo. Yes, you, that was insane. Right? It was crazy. I thought we were, li- we were literally going to crash into the Somebody other boat. Somebody almost took me out and my rods and my motor. I turned around and there was a bow of a boat in my face and he didn't even say, hey, Look out. It's yeah, it's insane because everyone out there is just yelling at each other, but everyone knows everybody. Right. And I'm just like sitting there and I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. I feel like literally the only female out there at that time. I felt bad what they were doing in that <laughs> section of the river, just how many fish were coming out of there. But yeah. they literally they're throwing fish back at the hatchery right now. There's so many fish in that system that it was actually a good thing. That yeah, Eric, were we had Eric C on recently, and um, he said it was actually okay to take those those salmon in those numbers. Did you guys limit they're out? They're just gonna die. Uh, yeah, we took our limit, which was two. Yeah. Um, but we did um, catch a lot of fish. Right. But obviously we put them back in. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we kept our we kept our limit, which was two, and. Uh, I did catch a really nice big male, which was probably about 18 to 19 pounds. So he cool. was pretty Whoa. big for me. <laughs> and um, Yeah, that's half your mass, basically. <laughs> we and need to get a picture of this. For, did you get pictures? <laughs> What's that? Did you get pictures of the fish? Yes, I did. We need, that's yeah. we need to get a that picture of, of her standing next to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like half your size. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, so where were we? Because I just oh I just so yeah so it off. actually I it took me a good five minutes just to reel him in. Uh, really? My arms fatigued so fast it was so hard. And I'm like I don't think I'm gonna bring this. In. I'm I'm not gonna be able to bring him in. And finally I think he fatigued and that's when I took my opportunity to reel him in and brought him in and oh man it was so much fun so much fun. Did Noah pay for that or did you? No, no. I went on my own. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do uh, do Noah employees have? Um, say like bag limits like the rest of us or you guys just get to take whatever you want no <laughs> no of course not no we don't get any special privileges <laughs> oh okay well um well, tell us a bit about your background like why how'd you get into biology you know start from the beginning um so i'm originally from the sacramento area i was born and raised in woodland and i've always had a passion for animals and so i always thought that oh i'm gonna become a vet And when I started going to school, um, when I started college, I realized that becoming a vet wasn't going to be the right fit for me. And I think that it was missing the conservation and sustainability piece for me. And um, I thought that, you know, working for Noah would be the perfect career path because I love water. I love fish. I love the ocean. So... I just thought, you know, that was actually the direction that I wanted to move into. Um, I did business at Chico State and I I had to go take this. They just started a sustainability program. Oh, uh, really? And I I was like, I have to go take this. Yeah. I mean, same thing. I just I've been outdoors all my life. And so that's pretty cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So um, that's kind of um, how it it started for me. So right out of college, did you were? You started working for them? Yep, I did. Wow. Yeah, I started interning for them right out of college. And um, no, actually, I started interning for the, for NIMS um, while I was still in school. And so how long have you been there? Or did you say already? No, um, I've been there since for about actually 10 years now. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what, what sort of a degree? I mean, obviously you get a biology degree, but you have to specialize in any <laughs> certain aspect of biology. Um, for that particular, for the degree that I had, um, my degree was uh, wildlife, fish, and conservation biology. So it covered a lot of different aspect, aspects of wildlife biology, uh, fish, birds, and mammals. And so I kind of wanted to get a sense of all the different areas. And I'm glad I did because it was a lot of fun. I learned so much. But I always knew that fisheries was where I wanted to go. Yeah. Oh, cool. You like fishing. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so what it, ex, I've always, like I was telling you, I've always looked at what the NOAA website just to go see future forecasted flows and kind of plan, Title my, stuff. F- plan my fly fishing trips based around that site. But can you explain to our listeners what NOAA is? And 
what, what they do? Um, yeah. yeah. So Noah. I know that's a broad question because <laughs> they do a lot. I know they do a lot. So Noah is actually under the Department of Commerce, and Noah is considered an umbrella agency. And so um, under NOAA, there's a bunch of different types of agencies relating to climate, the ocean, weather, and coast. And so NIMFS, which is National Marine Fishery Service, is under NOAA um, and also the Weather Service. So a big misconception that people think is that when they hear NOAA, they automatically think of the Weather Service. Mm-hmm. They, they think, oh, you work for right. the Weather Service. It's like, I, no. I did up until I started doing this podcast, to be honest. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. So um, I'm just like, no, actually, we are, there's other, other entities um, under NOAA, and National Marine Fisheries Service is one of them. But the Weather Service, obviously, is a very popular um, agency under NOAA because they they're utilizing you know all the satellites and they basically have the big bucks right I mean they're the ones kind of with their yeah. fingers on the button yeah. and right and yeah they do that, they do a lot yeah um, I, that was what I was how I was explained especially with the river flows um, it, like sea deck uh, you know at a state level but NOAA kind of uses we'll use satellites and mm-hmm. all the snowpack <laughs> and everything that they take a lot of data to compile this information where um, like Sea Deck is just based off of, you know, gauges that are out there along along the rivers. That's kind of I don't know. That's kind of how I broke it down. Yeah. Is that, does that mm-hmm. is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Nice, Nick. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, they do they do a lot. Um, and there's some things that I probably don't fully understand. Right. But, I mean, it's 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 a big agency. I mean, yeah. it's nationwide. So, so you know, when when we were doing the intro, you you said that uh, well, we said that NIMS rolls up underneath NOAA. Um, so, talk a bit about what NIMS is responsible for, and then what your primary role is there, and you know, kind of a day to day. Um, so, NIMS is responsible for the ocean resources and habitat, and um, another misconception that uh, people might have is when I tell them that I'm a fish, fish, fisheries biologist, they automatically think that, oh, I get to work out of a lab and I get to play with fish all day. But actually, uh, I said, no, actually, we don't. We um, use the science to make policy and management decisions. That data that's been collected by yeah. the biolog- biologists on the field. Mm-hmm. To, right. um, we have a science center out of Santa Cruz. Oh, okay. So mm. uh, we use their information. And in doing so we um help it helps us in this decision making process for uh the listed species under the endangered species act uh, but i kind of wanted to go back to the biology piece in mm-hmm. terms of because i f- forgot that um what got me interested in biology and sort of in terms yeah. of like my background a little bit further and um I, I've only started fishing for the past several years and I know it's ironic because I'm a fish biologist. Um, it's not too late, (laughs) but, um, growing up, I'm, so I'm first generation here. And so culturally my family wasn't into fishing or hunting. So, um, but we did go camping a lot and actually that was one of my favorite pastimes as a kid. Mm -hmm. I just, I loved it. And so in through those experiences um, and camping, um, I would sort of wander off on my own and explore and kind of sort of had a self-discovery of my love for nature and the environment. And I think that's when the seed was planted for me and in um, realizing my interest in biology. Hmm. Wow. That's, uh, that's what started. I've been camping since I was two and I'm pretty sure that's what, that's what did it for me too. Just being out there. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And, um, I, it wasn't like I, I didn't have a mentor or somebody that to show me the way of, you know, the natural world. Right. I just, it was, um, it was just sort of like that self discovery and having it's a like huge imagi- imagination and, and intellectual, intellectual curiosity. Will do yes. That too, yeah, you know? exactly. And, mm-hmm. and touching things out in, in the wild. And obviously there's probably some things you shouldn't touch, but I was a kid then and I just wanted to touch everything. And <laughs> Not a lot of kids have that mentor these days. That's, that's kind of what our goal is for this podcast is to get people educated and, and excited about that. Yeah. You know? Most of them are glued to a uh, iPhone these days. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So let, let's talk about the, the uh, endangered species act, species act a little bit or ESA. Um, wh- what is it? Um, I think, Obviously, a lot of people know, but there's a few that don't, and especially 
you know, what species on in our rivers locally are, are on the ESA, if any? So the Endangered Species Act is an environmental law that was enacted in 1973, and it's to help protect and conserve the species that are listed. And there's two types. There's a species that can be either endangered or threatened. And a species that's endangered is um, uh, can be in danger of extinction, either a part or all of its range. And a species that is threatened it's, is likely to become, become endangered. endangered in the foreseeable future. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And Spring run salmon and... Those are on the endangered species. Yeah, so um, the species that are that we have jurisdiction over in the Sacramento office Mm -hmm. is spring run Chinook salmon, Sacramento River winter run Chinook salmon, Central Valley steelhead, and green sturgeon. And they're all in the threatened. Actually, yes. So they're all in a threatened. uh, They're all threatened species except for winter run. Winter run is endangered. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we've um, and we've talked about this multiple times in prior podcasts, and I read some some articles about it that there used to be you know. Just for a steelhead example, ten or a million steelhead running in the Central Valley, yeah. and now there's like a thousand or whatever it's, it is. You know, there's, it's there's really a, sad. It's yeah. super sad. Yeah, it makes it depresses me every it time. Is. And that I just saw a post today on Instagram. This guy um, caught a coastal steelhead already, bright chrome, and he just said, Ch- "Cherish and protect mm-hmm. this catch." You know, if you catch mm-hmm. something like this, like be careful with it. Yeah. You know, don't yeah. abuse it. This, this is a, this is magic. You know. Kind of cool. I don't know. It's, I didn't take it to heart too much, you know. Yeah, you didn't think fun. about it too much at the time. I always had fun just catching fish. Yeah. But when you start thinking about it, it's mm-hmm. they're definitely it's a fragile ecosystem. It is, and we've changed it so much. Right. <laughs> yeah, and the more people we talk to, the more appreciation I get for it because I just get a little bit, you know, peel, peeling back the layers of the onion with my understanding of how, how all this stuff works it's oh pretty, we're gonna peel back cool. more onions today all right. <laughs> M- make our eyes more water. layers <laughs> i'm gonna get heated <laughs> <laughs> so the the spring run the winter the steelhead and, and the then, green sturgeon oh and the, that's right i was gonna mm-hmm. yeah, the green sturgeon yeah. yeah there's yeah right here in chico we have a huge spawning ground that they that they all kind of congregate in and they've that's what they've closed fishing the green sturgeon from basically 162 and, and above. So basically, if you catch any of these that are on those lists, you you can't keep them, right? So mm-hmm. you, you can't even get them out. Take them everything. out of the water. Technically, you're not supposed to take yeah. them out of the water. Well, how are you going to get the the green? Cut the line. Yeah. You're supposed to cut the line. It's going to hurt my Instagram game. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I, I've actually I've commented about that because guys are holding these big green sturgeon up out of the water. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, DFG is going to be all over you. <laughs> <laughs> Do they, and they do. They do go after people because yeah. of that. They should. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so we also have other area office offices in California. We have Long Beach, Santa Rosa, and Arcata, but they cover other species like a, like coastal species, coho, um, southern steelhead, and um, Long Beach covers uh, sea turtles and marine mammals. Southern steelhead? Mm-hmm. So that's just basically any steelhead probably below the Gowalla and Garcia or Fort Bragg. No, it's actually uh, further south. I, and they I all think. have their CCWs. <laughs> <laughs> Even further than that. I'm not. Yeah, I, I'm not it. sure exactly where their jurisdiction lies for that particular species. Um, the yeah. San Lorenzo, right? That's that one. Isn't isn't that the river down in Santa Cruz that? Pretty sure it is. Anyways, the, I was just curious how that was. I'd never heard anybody say Southern Steelhead, and so I was just I was wondering where that how does how the you get on the boat they go. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not too sense. familiar with all of the species on the right. other area offices. So right. There's a lot. There is a lot. And like little fry, <laughs> like a little tiny like crustacean or some weird thing. <laughs> or like, seagrass. Okay. Seagrass is also listed. Oh, wow. So it can be... It, I'm it's, saying that's eel, just not, eelgrass. So that's a vegetable or vegetation <laughs> of some sort. <laughs> I, I thought that um, I up until right now, I thought that it could only be like live things. Well, live things. I mean, I guess they're not dead. You mean vertebrates? Thank you, mm-hmm. vertebrates. Mm-hmm. So how do these fish get off this endangered or threatened species list? Well, there's a delisting criteria. Um and pretty much the 
fish that are listed um, have to meet a certain criteria. So they have to make they have to make sure that, for one, they are a viable population, and uh, they also have to look at their critical habitat. And they have to make sure that these species can survive through catastrophic catastrophic events like droughts and right. floods and earthquakes and whatnot. Um, but also it's something to think about if a species becomes delisted, they no longer have the federal protections that they had before. Right. And so that's why some of them are to, still on there yeah. because they want to keep that. They want to keep it on. Yeah. I, was, so, I guess I was going to say um, off the top of your head, has there been any species that have been delisted? And if so, how long did that process take? It seems like it would take a long time. Um, not from our Central Valley office. But um, they're all in the decline. I think there was a gray whale that was delisted. I'm not sure how long it took. Um, it can take a process. I can. I'm, it's I, I'm be really years, not sure. Right? Yeah, just because, because just gathering. They the have to closely look at the it. species. Yeah, yeah, and the trends, and to make sure that this is something that they want to do. I'm just, and hatcheries aren't <laughs> the answer, right? I mean, that's not going to bring back the species. They they lay. It's crazy. One of my friends is in charge of laying down uh, nets, uh, spawning nets mm-hmm. for the, the green surgeon, and then they actually can, you know, figure out how you know how well they're the doing. Egg nets. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and it's funny mm-hmm. when they talk about that stuff because I've seen I see sturgeon all the time. Yeah. Big ones. Right. They'll be sitting in like pretty shallow water mm-hmm. and you're just cruising. And you're like, oh my god, there's a huge sturgeon. But I'd never catch like a little tiny one. Oh, they're you so know? cute. I, they, are, they are. They are. They are. They look like a little miniature dinosaur. <laughs> they do. <laughs> the big ones look like actual dinosaurs. They look like huge, something from like the prehistoric scales. era. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just. I'm just curious. I guess just protecting them like that. And I, I keep wondering when they're going to start doing that with other of these species. They like should, the just, Central Valley uh, they should just put like some underwater acoustics on and play Barry White <laughs> right over the top. <laughs> right over the top. And then it's like just... The, Chad I, Alderson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no. It might work. Got to try everything once. Uh, that's that's interesting though. Um, you, you just don't hear about how all that... the the back work that, the, yeah, that goes the, into it. Yeah, you know? and how we try to protect them and the things that we do to protect them. And That's cool. It's just, it's a lot of um, behind the scenes. I know my buddy was fired up because the flows were being jumped around on the feather. All these sturgeon came in right into the downtown section of the feather. They were spawning, and then the flows came down. And when the sturgeon feel that or it happens, they immediately think that you know they need to get out to survive, like they're going to boogie out of there. Mm-hmm. So he was super, I guess they did spawn, but I don't know. There's just, there's so much going in. Yeah. And so the flow, they were coming to spawn, the flows dropped suddenly, and then they thought they were going to boogie before the deed did. was done. They did. Basically. But they, had, the spawn had happened. They did. They did spawn a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. each tributary is managed differently. It's managed slightly different. Right. Especially yeah. for, mm-hmm. between the Sacramento River Basin and the San Joaquin Basin. It's just, they're completely different watersheds. And the water quality is different. Yep. The flows are different. And that's what I saw his frustration. Like he, he's, he cares so much about what he does. And yet he has no control over when somebody just hits the button and like all of a sudden the flows are gone. You know, yeah. it's, mm. it's kind of crazy. There needs to, is there more, is there, is that going more towards the direction of all these organizations, NIMPS, NOAA, DWR, all the work together? To so yeah, we do. So that's part of our process and the policy and management side of things is we collaborate with a lot of different agencies, a lot of state and federal agencies and private entities mm-hmm. um, to work together to, for a common goal to um, try to recover these species. Right. You've been there quite a while. Um, how are the information systems pretty well integrated across the board so you guys have a kind of like a, a clear picture i'd say cross department cross um, in terms on, of their mission everybody's yeah. mission. um yeah so everybody like so for example fish and wildlife service has their own mission so mm-hmm. they're more heavily focused on you know they have a whole bunch of terrestrial species they have uh delta smelt um right. and uh they do care about the salmon as well and so for us Obviously, our mission is the list of species that I've mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And so, but we all try to work together for a common goal. I think it's just easier that way mm-hmm. yeah. to try to get something done. And they all run, they all roll up under NOAA, I'm assuming. No, no, no. actually, oh. NOAA is the only agency under the Department of Commerce. Okay. Uh, oh. Fish and Wildlife Service is under the Department of Interior. Interior. 
uh, Bureau of Reclamation is under Interior as well. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess my question is on the information system side, and if you don't know it, it's fine. Well, we can research it after. But um, if there there's different departments and the data that they're making decisions, policy decisions on, mm-hmm. um, if that data is shared across, you know, common yeah. Absolutely. Set of software way that you know if, yeah. if you do some research and you put it in the system, the guy over in the Department of Interior knows about it. Yeah, we yeah we share data, we share information. Cool. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 a great approach to have in terms of trying to manage the species. Well, I know. Like, what's crazy to me, like you mentioned it was created in 1973, or the mm-hmm. ES, the Endangered Species Act, right? Yeah, I and think it was it was amended from 1960 something i don't quite remember but i think it was slightly called something else and then when it became amended in 1973 and became enacted i think they changed the name to the endangered species act so for a very short period of time we've only been gathering this data and looking into protecting these fish and it's now for like the first time you know farmers and and Everybody's kind of trying to, and the people, right? Protect the people first. <laughs> you know, people got to survive. But then, then the fish, then the f- rice, right? Or the farmers. I don't know. It's just, it seems well, like it is get, it's going in a better direction yeah, now more so than ever. Something to think about that. Um, so if the habitat is degraded and um, let's say the water quality isn't very good, then how can salmon survive and have a viable healthy population Mm -hmm. to thrive and so in that it's kind of an a good indicator to note that the water quality isn't that great and that's where we fish and where we do recreational activities Mm. and it's our source of drinking water so in thinking about those things it all comes back to us and so that's why we should care about why we have listed fish in our rivers what got them there in the first place right. on the listing status. So what, what, um, what watersheds do you guys work with mainly out of your office? Um, so we mainly focus on the central Valley out of the Sacramento office. And, um, what I do is I mainly focus on the San Joaquin river basin. So my jurisdiction, um, includes the Merced, Tuolumne, the Stan, the Calaveras, McCallamy, Cosumnes, and the lower San Joaquin river. Okay. That was going to be my next question. Can you, cause that's a broad, the central, that lower central yeah. valley. Yeah. Is, there's a lot. Yeah. And it's just me. <laughs> and Whoa. it's just you? Yeah. Whoa. I mean, I, we have a group that's, yeah. um, that represents the San Joaquin River Basin. Yeah. But they mostly work on the restoration program, which okay. the restoration program, the San Joaquin R- River Restoration mm-hmm. Program is everything upstream of the confluence of the Merced River. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you know a lot about the Mokolomi and the, the, return of record return of salmon and steelhead that they've recently yeah. been bragging about. Oh, that's great. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I thought that was pretty cool too. <laughs> it, it sounds like they've been using a new technique of barging these fish down, down to the Delta or just down, you know, or battle right. Creek hatchery or the Coleman hatchery. They trucked them down. To I, the, I read different. What? I heard it was Barry white. <laughs> yeah, I used it twice they, now. They truck the you fish. You kind of sound like Barry White, yeah, actually. Yeah, he does. He, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they truck those fish down. They didn't return. Guys have been catching uh, salmon all over the Delta, you know, and just fly fishing. They're down there trying to catch striper, and they're catching all these salmon. And people are like, why are we catching all these salmon? Oh, it's that poor return, right? They didn't know where to go. Hmm. They got thrown into the Delta, and so they're kind of all confused. But the fact that the McCollumy District has been Yeah, East barging, Bay Mud barging these fish down and then having them return like that's pretty it's pretty cool that's they, a good story they do great work there on the mccallamy we work a lot with east bay mud so that's the water district that manages the, okay the, the river okay cool mm-hmm. so i hope it sounds like um maybe that the other um organizations or other hatcheries will take take you know take this take as a note a, yeah yeah it's 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 difficult because um is it like a finance thing? Expensive to no, do? No, not not necessarily. It's just different for each system. The water's managed different for each system. Mm-hmm. So um, not every tributary is going to have They're a water district that's managed the way the way East Bay Mud does. They also have a hatchery there too. So that's also what makes them different from all right. the other tributaries on um, the San Joaquin They're given certain River. parameters and they have to, they do it with their... And, and just yeah. the logistics of that, that particular watershed play a role in what they can do with it policy-wise, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. 
There's a lot of water to just for you. That's crazy. Just for me? Just yeah. for you. Just for me, yeah. not for the fish. <laughs> <laughs> so what are what are some of the more uh, notable projects you are working on? It sounds like you've got quite a few things to 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 do. Um, I've been working a lot on uh, fish screen projects this year. Um, I'm the lead uh, NIPS biologist for the Calaveras River Habitat Conservation Plan. And um, fish screens, explain please. Yeah, I was gonna fish ask. screens. Oh, you guys don't know about fish no, screens. No, I, I just some of our listeners, I, I don't, might not. I mean, ah. I, I know conceptually what they are, but I don't know what they're for. So, pretty much, um, I'm just gonna break it down. Let's just say a federal agency like Fish and Wildlife Service um, funds a project um, uh, for a water diversion to be screened. And in that process, we have to look at the engineering and to make sure that the fish screen itself is going to protect the listed fish. Uh, they're not going to from be getting into that waterway. Be, from right. getting entrained into the. Um, Would this be like an in, intake pump, for example, yes, and there's yeah. a screen in front of it? Okay. Yeah. So, but so it's not just it any is, plain or? old screen that you're just going to put up there. I mean, there's just this whole engineering aspect that's oh. just completely over my expertise but so every intake pump's got different parameters in yeah. terms of what the screen specs yeah would so be. Okay. what they do is Whoa. they'll look at um which are the high priority diversions that need to be screened that may cause um, the most harm to listed fish because right. you know the little guys the juveniles that are going out um into the delta can become entrained so there's no protection for them so a fish screen will get proposed and design and um, become constructed. Uh, and so there's different types of fish screens out there. There's cone screens, there's the flat screen, cone screen, uh, there's the flat screen. Um, HD I, screens, Do you know no, 4K. <laughs> do you know what the one on the Glen Calusa Irrigation Canal is? Um, I'm not too familiar it's, with that one. From what I understand, it's pretty fancy and high tech. Is it? Like, well, if you can imagine all the debris and things that, that can pile up al along these screens. And, yeah. So and then, and then how do they, how do they <laughs> remove that? In the and, fall. and how do they remove that? And, and then how do they allow like the, some of the fish to move around in there, but like protect the other ones. Right. I mean, I, I don't know. There's, it's just a lot it's that goes just, into it. Yeah. There is a lot that goes into actually implementing the project itself. Yeah but also to maintain the project itself after it's been constructed because right. uh, yeah. they have to make sure that uh, the screen is properly functioning yeah. to, cleared and all to that. make sure that it's actually not causing harm to the fish and become impinged or, mm -hmm. or why not to make sure that um, it's getting properly cleaned. There's also the, the cone screens actually have a self-rotating brush that helps to take off the debris every so often. Cone screens are the ones that you'll see in the river and they're actually turning. No, that's the, a drum screen. Drum, so okay. That's another type of fish screen. Okay. That's to collect though, right? Not, not so much for passage or do they go through those? No, they don't. No, it's just another, it just really depends on the flows and on the location of the diversion and how mm -hmm. big the diversion is, um, is how they figure out what's the best way to screen that diversion. So okay. the, like you were mentioning right now, that that's a drum, that's a drum screen. Okay. And then, oh, go ahead. No, I'm good. No, you first. <laughs> I insist. So. <laughs> I, I, I lost it. Oh, okay. So how about the, uh, the restoration projects that are going on in, in your area? Can you talk about those a little bit? Um, we do a lot of gravel augmentation projects. And so what that means is actually, replenishing and placing uh, spawning gravel into the upper reaches of a river or mm -hmm. right below or most likely below the dam. Probably a lot of that going on because of high water this year. Um, well, it's part of restoring the habitat um, oh. because because of the dams, the the gravel behind the dams and up in the upper watersheds, they, that's, it's blocking that gravel so it can't replenish itself. And so obviously that gravel eventually gets washed down and mm -hmm. um, down into the lower they end of the river. They did that on the feather. They actually yeah. trucked in. Eric was talking about yep. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tons of rock. for Because if you, you imagine like even high water comes through, it'll wash all that gravel yeah. spawning right. the rocks away. And, and that's it. And what it's supposed happened. to do that. It's supposed it, to. Right. That's the but it just doesn't get replenished. Exactly. exactly. From upstream. Yeah. Right. yeah. So yeah. they actually bring it in and, and comes. Then you have these big rocks that the salmon can't dig up and make their beds in. 
in. Right. right. So that they need they need those smaller pebbles. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> I mean, and it's and the reason why we do that it's because um, it helps to increase their chances chances of survival. Mm-hmm. And so, kind of backtracking a little bit, um, we aren't aren't the ones that actually do the work. Um, another federal entity will do the work. They the private work. party, like a third private third party, or well, um, let's just say for example, again, Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, yeah. They'll come in and they'll propose, design a project, and um, in order for them to actually carry out the project, they have to come to us to get a federal permit so they they can be in compliance right. um, to do the project. And in that process, it's called Section Seven of the Endangered Species Act. And so through that in through in that process, we analyze the impacts of the actual construction of the project. And although it's beneficial, we still have to look at the temporary impacts of the project that may it may have on the listed species themselves or the habitat. Wow. You must be busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do you even get all that done? Uh. <laughs> so um Another thing to think about is Section 7 is considered to be like the first line of defense. So we are trying to make it through the Section 7 process. We want to make sure we're not making things worse through the implementation of these projects. Um, we want to make sure that we're not further declining the species or degrading the habitat even more. Mm-hmm. Or That's funny the term is that. called adver- to it's adversely it's modify the critical habitat. It's just, it's like, yeah, okay. just like Transformers Sector 7. <laughs> Never heard of it. So never will. Are you that's that's <laughs> my that's my thing on this podcast. <laughs> Is this like a ongoing like inside joke? No, no. We, no it's we always just throw in weird pop culture references sometimes <laughs> and I think people get them most of the time. So do um all even third parties come in with these projects and plans to that have to run through you, or is it? Is no, it it's just actually federal- it has to be another federal entity. Okay, um, right. but uh, let's just say um, a, a third party, like a private party, can become an applicant. Mm-hmm. Um, but the there has to be a federal nexus in order to gotcha. be able to consult with us through the Section Seven process. Gotcha. And so. Through the Section Seven process, we also want to minimize the impacts. So we'll um, they'll either have conservation me- measures already proposed, or we'll work with them to make sure that uh, we'll propose any minimization measures. But it's it's a cooperative interagency process, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and uh, yeah. So our recovery plan is where we try to make things better and try to improve. Um, the species and the habitat towards recovery. So section seven is more of like the front lines, making sure that things don't get worse. And I'm going to assume any species that's in the recovery plan probably belongs to the ESA. Yes, because um, okay. they their members or they're listed either endangered or yeah. otherwise. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're looking at data like of situations like the Feather River and when um, spawning gravel has been reintroduced or you know they're doing some some type of work in that and they, you kind of see what the back end what has happened and then you can kind of decide okay this they did a really good job here so it makes sense we should implement it implement it here is that a kind of a gist of um, how it works or yeah so through our recovery plan we have a set of recovery actions and restoration being one of them and so we rely on other entities to propose those kind of projects yeah. um as being one example to right. try to work towards recovering the species the reason I, I'd ask is that I hear about that happening like on the Trinity and the Feather and all these different places. And it's almost like there's all these different companies that are bidding to do it, you know, or they come in. Like one was from British Columbia wow. that came down to do the restoration project. And Yeah, I want the gravel contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> you guys balling. I know, right? Um, so on a, on a typical recovery plan, I don't know if they're, they're typical, but um, are there any – like big themes on each one that they they typically do? So um, on the Central Valley Recovery Mm -hmm. Plan, which is out of our office, it covers the listed salmonids. So winter run Chinook salmon, spring run Chinook salmon, and Central Valley steelhead. Um, It doesn't include sturgeon. Sturgeon is still in the works in terms of 
the development of a recovery plan. So when that get, does get finalized, it's going to be a separate recovery plan. So it's not too late to recommend an action plan of Barry White then. <laughs> okay. It's the last time I promise I'll say Barry White. <laughs> she, she pounds the table. <laughs> Uh, oh my god that's pretty funny <laughs> <laughs> you are turning bright red right now <laughs> he is red he is bright red yeah that's my tell <laughs> <laughs> he's ready for christmas yeah. um yeah. Anywho. <laughs> so another aspect of uh the something unique about our recovery plan and unique to the central valley is reintroduction and so the reason why that is so important because we're looking at reintroduction as um, the means to try to recover the species because the habitat has been blocked by the dams mm-hmm. um, for um, it's blocked over ninety percent of their historical spawning habitat. Yeah, and so are you talking about the winter run salmon right here? Um, any uh, like the, the yeah, salmonids all, in general, all, yeah, okay. the listed salmonids in general, and so. We're looking at fish passage over these hide head dams as a means to try to recover the species. Yeah, that's big talk right now about put, taking in there. I guess there's already a lift that's already built into the Keswick Dam that they are Shasta Dam that they can put these bring these salmon up, put them mm-hmm. in the lake so they can go back up into these tributaries mm-hmm. and spawn. Yeah, it's in a feasible. Yeah, um, it's in, it's a feasible stage basically right now. Yeah, to so determine what's going to. That's gonna, pretty cool. Things aren't, you know, looking so great As for, um, in terms you, like below the dam, you know, right. result of climate change, warming temperatures and so the habitat availability is just going downhill. So, I mean, in order for there to be a chance for these species to recover, um, that's, that's a, where people are looking. Yeah. So, you know about that project? Um, I'm not too to familiar you? with that project because it's not in uh, my right. jurisdiction. Right. But it's the same way for the Calaveras or the McCollumy or um, all these... Yeah, Stanislaus. for the other, yeah, for the Tuolumne and Merced. Yeah, the Stanislaus is, I've never really fished that river, but um, good fishing, good fishery. I mean, yeah. What do you like to fish? Steelhead, well, there's steelhead, steelhead in there, right, mm-hmm. still? Um, trout, and I've heard that you can, are you falling asleep over there? No. I'm <laughs> I heard that um, you could basically do a float down that river and catch trout and striper all in the same, which I don't know if that's a great thing, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds... It, obviously, for a, a recreational fish, fisherman, it sounds like right, a really right. fun thing to what do, do but it's not... Um, they're an invasive species. They're not native. Right. So, I mean, there are... Um, they're eating our salmon. <laughs> I mean, they're <laughs> voracious predators. Yeah, and I've seen that firsthand. yeah. Yeah. We catch 40 to 50 pounders here all the time. I, you know, sometimes I just want to catch one and open up their bellies just, just to, to see, see what's, what's in, them. in them. Yeah. We've done that a few times. We see a lot of crawdads. We see a lot of pike minnows. Pike, yeah. I've heard mostly pike minnows. I've yet We've to, talked to a few people that have cut them open, mostly guides, right? And yeah. they're saying pike minnows. I've been out there in the f- January and February and seen them having, taking havoc on the um, hatchery salmon populations. You know, they're coming down and just, huge pots pods <clears throat> and the striper and the birds they're all they're all on top of them yeah so that's why that that barging system is working so well on the colony i mean that's makes sense yeah, yeah it helps to increase their survival to go out to sea and yeah. become adults and come back yeah i dig it <laughs> and that particular barging system they they keep them in the water and yeah, kind of move them through the system <coughs> to imprint them mm-hmm. something yeah in so the they section. can imprint and be able to smell their yeah, can you talk talk rivers, about the, the? I know we touched on barging once, but this particular type of barging because there's different types, and this particular type to keep them in the water the whole time. Can you explain why they do that? Before I want to plant a seed in into section seven or sector seven. And, okay, and, and For, to I, hire, to I didn't want to I didn't want to split hairs, but since you brought it up twice now, it, that's actually ghost in the shell. To hire to hire not anglers, transformers to hire anglers to protect these these fish coming down the river. Instead of barging them, you know, like maybe if they do let them go, just have some anglers out there ready to catch it. No? No. <laughs> Dang. So anyway, yeah, back tried, to my question before Nick yeah, got me sidetracked. Yeah, so it's important to, to keep them in the river so that they can imprint and they can yeah. recognize their natal stream so that when they're ready to come back from the ocean, they'll remember their smell and be able to come back to their natal natal streams and um, spawn again. So crazy that they did. Can... You know that they smell in parts per million. 
No, I didn't know that. I knew that they picked up a smell in the yeah. river, and that's you know, yeah. Each river has is a different signature, different. So it's like almost like ant pheromones. I don't know about ant pheromones. <laughs> well, that's how they go in lines. They they, a, they figure out where to find food. Like one will go oh, forage, and then that's why they're oh that okay. one comes back with food, and he's like oh just. I don't know if he just cropped us the whole way home, but they, uh, that's how they, there's a famous, there's a famous, cool. uh, hole up on, on the North Umpqua where the steelhead are being protected. It's actually a tributary of the North Umpqua. And there's a, a guy that's been living there year in and year out protecting these fish because they all come in and spawn on this one hole and people were going in there and catching them. Even heard stories of dynamite being used, like crazy stuff. Dynamite. So we went oh down there and talked to this guy who's <laughs> super interesting. If you can imagine. Um, get him on the show. I, I know, right? He would talk about going up river and taking his finger and sticking it in the trib, and, and a couple minutes later, all those steelhead would just start freaking out. They would be swimming around in the hole, like in circles, jumping out of the water. They could smell the just, predator. They could, yeah. It just it messed them all up. So I mean, you imagine mm. something like that, like what all these these fish in our Central Valley have to go through to, to come back and spawn. Well, that's that's interesting. It's like it's that. almost right. un, it's almost unbelievable. It's like going through the gauntlet. I mean, yeah. they just first of all they have to survive through their natal streams, right? And then they have to go through the delta, and then they have to survive the ocean and become adults and be able to come back I and then do it. I keep thinking technology okay. and all the data and things that you guys are doing is going to... They have a long journey. It's, gonna, it's incredible. It's going to change <laughs> our, our future for the better as far as fish populations go. But we'll I see. Like, I like that positive outlook of yours. I, I think it's going to happen. I think it's the boots. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for all, coming in tonight, Monica, and all this great information. We really appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you guys for having me. Making the drive up from Sacramento. <laughs> So if uh, our listeners want to um, queue in or just get some more information from you, where's a good place for them to find it? Um, they can go to our West Coast region website. Um, so that covers um, all of the West Coast, California, Oregon, and Washington, and Idaho. Um, so the website is uh, westcoast.fisheries.noaa.gov. Awesome. Cool, okay. cool. And we'll put that all in the show notes like we usually do. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Thank you guys good. so much. It's been N- fun. Thanks no again. problem. <laughs> all right. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening. We'll have another one soon. We're pumping them out, boys and girls. (laughs) What? Bye. Bye. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Bill. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vienchen, Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.bill.